Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, when the Grenfell fire happened uh, six months ago, we quickly realised something had gone wrong with building regulations, or at least the way they were implemented. The result in that case was a tragedy that has prompted a complete review of fire safety in tall buildings. Tonight, we can bring you details of another area of fire safety regulation which some believe needs examining. It is that which purports to prevent furniture from burning. Now, this special report on the problem and how we got here is from our policy editor, Chris Cook. There's one area where Britain has usually thought of itself as having the toughest safety regulation on earth. Furniture. We subject it to harder tests than anyone else. To try to make it as fireproof as possible. For good reason. For example, a sofa can be a massive fire hazard. But questions have arisen about the safety of the rules we use to contain this risk. The civil servant who was, until recently, in charge of reviewing these regulations has had a change of heart about their wisdom since he got involved in this field in the mid-2000s. I would have said these are the most stringent fire safety domestic furniture regulations in the world. They're a great success. They are saving lives and uh, you know, the rest of the world should really come up to the same level of requirements that we have in the UK. But you absolutely don't believe that now? I absolutely don't believe that now. In Britain, furniture fabric has to pass very tough tests, uniquely tough, in the world before you're allowed to sell it on the open market. Manufacturers, though, have worked out that the easiest way to get through those tests is simply to load the fabric with chemical flame retardants. The Grenfell Tower fire is an apt moment to consider the wisdom of this approach. Within the tower, the fire obviously moved through the building very rapidly, and people reported noxious black smoke filling the interior. A dozen residents were treated afterwards for cyanide poisoning, including a 12-year-old member of the Gomez family. The smoke was certainly, you know, it was so intense that as soon as you, you uh, took a, a mouthful of air, or in this case smoke, uh, you were gagging. Smoke is always bad for you. It can always kill you. But the thing is, the commonest fire retardants in use in UK furniture work by interfering with the chemistry of the flame. And a byproduct of their use is that when a fire gets going, the smoke is more toxic. A new peer reviewed paper in the journal Chemosphere suggests they make it much more toxic. The first thing we found was that the sofas burnt at almost the same kind of rate. You didn't get a particular slowing down comparing the non-flame retarded sofas with the flame retarded ones. And the second thing is that we got between two and three times more toxicity in the smoke from the UK fire retarded sofas than we did from the European non-fire retarded sofas. More toxicity means more carbon monoxide and hydrogen cyanide in the smoke. But the chemical companies point to their own research, saying that UK sofas clearly do better at resisting fires than other European sofas when they're first ignited. And advocates of flame retardants note that even if it makes mature fires more dangerous, preventing fires is the only smart strategy. The best way to deal with toxicity of a smoke is to begin with not to have a fire because not only you will benefit from not having the toxic smoke, but you will benefit from not having flame spread. You will benefit from not having the structure being uh, put into structural danger. You will have no problem of a fire traveling to different uh, compartments and finding different fuels. This is, however, not the first wave of concern about retardants. Uh, so the flame retardants are what are called semi-volatile. That means they are coming out always from the couch. You don't have to sit on it. They're always coming out and they're heavy, they drop into dust. You get dust on your hands and you eat a sandwich, you're eating flame retardants. Our own government just last year noted 
Flame retardant chemicals, particularly brominated flame retardants, can be harmful to human and animal health. There's a big question, though, about whether these regulations are actually preventing fires. For example, they don't really take account of the fact that in a sofa arm, you might have a load of flammable hessian or wood or even cardboard just under the surface. Professor Ryan does not support reducing flame retardant use, but also acknowledges the statistical difficulty in proving their effectiveness. When you look into medicine, for example, I envy them tremendously. They do meta-analysis, which is an analysis of the overviews of the reviews. As in far science, we, we cannot do meta-analysis. We, we, we have like three studies per topic uh, instead of 3,000, which is the level of studies that you will require to actually inform the politicians. So we operate in this area slightly in the dark. People from competing disciplines give different answers to the same questions. It's a complex public policy issue. So how did we end up with these rules? The story of our fire regulation really starts in the 1980s, when there was real disquiet about fire deaths, in part because we used horrifyingly flammable foam padding in furniture, which is now just banned, and more people smoked. By morning, this room could be a burnt-out shell. Because of that burning cigarette, someone forgot. This man is Bob Graham, then a Manchester firefighter, speaking in 1985 on Newsnight. We were running a feature on how many fires were then being caused by cigarettes. We've got a situation where we have the smallest ignition source in the home being responsible for the largest proportion of deaths. At that time, Assistant Chief Fire Officer Graham wanted cigarette companies to roll out self-extinguishing cigarettes to cut down on fires. Not a universally popular view in 1985. Here at the headquarters of the Tobacco Advisory Council, repeated requests for a spokesman to discuss self-extinguishing cigarettes have been met with polite refusals. The tobacco companies may not have been talking to Newsnight, but we do know that they were watching. Newsnight has dug up legal disclosures from the US which show just how concerned they were about our reports. One of them notes that their inability to put forward a defensible PR stance on these issues had been amply demonstrated by TV comments in July 1985. That's when that Newsnight report went out. They needed to find a way to get people to talk about fires as being caused by furniture, not by cigarettes. From these documents, we know that tobacco companies contributed to the development of flame retardants for furniture. In Britain, Big Tobacco set up a special Fire Safe Cigarette Working Group. This press conference, called by a West Midlands fire chief in 1988, was enormously helpful to them. It was critical in forcing the debate from cigarettes and onto furniture. And the documents show converting firefighters to their cause was a key plank of Big Tobacco's policy. Now, thanks to those court disclosures, we now know that the tobacco companies had actually been working on Mr. Graham and another firefighter who was on that podium. You see, the documents are pretty clear. The tobacco companies thought they had no credibility to talk about fire safety, and they needed a protective ring of firefighters who could do it for them. So they said Mr. Graham could be one of their so-called spark plugs people who could move the debate their way. So they met him, they engaged with him, they sought to make him see furniture rather than cigarettes as the problem. And we know that pretty soon he had changed his mind in that direction. We asked Mr Graham whether he knew back in the 1980s that he was being targeted by tobacco lobbyists. I didn't know that. <laughs> I mean, they, they sort of, they saw you and your, your support for the self extinguishing cigarette as a thing we had to, they had to deal with. Yeah, I was in, in the fire service centre and you wouldn't be allowed to do anything like that. You know, you couldn't deal with any businesses, whatever they were. So you but, didn't... But I never heard from them. So... Not that I can remember anyway. So you weren't aware at any point of the tobacco industry sort of... No, I wasn't. No, that's all new to me. Mr Graham says he just changed his mind in favour of furniture regulation. He wasn't alone. In 1988, the government was persuaded. Britain banned a lot of flammable foam and brought in the current tests. The response from Big Tobacco? Job done. Their memos refer to the group on fire safe cigarettes, self-extinguishing. That, though, wasn't the end of the lobbying. 
the chemical companies who make retardants became bigger players. The Alliance for Consumer Fire Safety in Europe aggressively lobbied to extend our rules to other EU countries. They had the same strategy, get a firefighter. I'd been retired, I think, about five years. Right. And then they asked for a meeting and I met them. And they said, uh, we'd like you to raise fire awareness in Europe. And I said, OK, but I do it my way. I'm not, you know, being influenced by anyone. And they were funded by the fire retardant company? Yes, by um, a committee of all the flame retardants manufacturers in Europe, which has halogenated phosphorus and all those kind, I understand. And at one time, I think we had smoke clown people as well. Okay. And the, so from its birth, the Alliance was really founded by the flame retardant companies with you as the executive frontman. I guess, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it'd be silly to say no to that. Mr. Graham stressed that the Alliance did not advocate for retardants in particular, although chemical companies would tend to benefit from the tough fire safety rules he wanted. But they're not the only lobby. Back in 2014, the business department proposed changing the test to make it more sensitive to how modern furniture is actually made. It doesn't represent the way that furniture is constructed and it doesn't take into account the many flammable materials that you can get close to the surface in the arms and, and so forth. You could never bring that test in now. The proposed test reforms would mean regulation of materials not currently covered by the rules, but would also mean an overall reduction in flame retardant use. So Mr Edge was expecting the chemical industry to resist. Another industry, though, was mobilised by the changes. The furniture industry really likes these regulations because they are a barrier to trade, because uh, it gives them a huge advantage in the home market. Because if you're a German manufacturer and you want to sell furniture into the UK, you've got to create a separate range that complies with our regulations. FIRA, a furniture industry body, said they thought that our rules need a full update, but just opposed Mr Edge's reforms because they thought they wouldn't meet the government's objectives. The government believes these regulations do need reform, but we don't spend much on research to balance the competing concerns about effectiveness and toxicity. So ministers sought consensus on what would work. But that collapsed in part because there's so much money riding on opposing change. Do you think that we make fire safety policy on a scientific basis? Not at the moment, no. I've been involved with, with committees that set regulations and address regulation changes, and I can tell you that I'm surprised uh, how little the role of science has in these committees. The standards process in the UK is dominated by people who can afford to attend the meetings, and those are usually people with a vested interest in a particular outcome. All the lobbying is funded by the industry. Uh, all the resistance to improvements in standards come from the industry and there's either money to be made or money to be lost. This is not ancient history. The government consulted once again last year on changes that would reduce the flame retardant load in our furniture. We don't know what they'll do, but we do know they face organised opposition from industry. Also, in the wake of the disaster in Kensington and with relatively little large-scale research to rely on, ministers may find it easiest to hope this concern burns itself out. Chris Cook there.